nobody tell Tom Brady and the Bucks, but Lele the Panda at the Memphis Zoo is going with the Kansas City Chiefs on Sunday. And as the excitement builds around the big game, tonight we bring you a behind the scenes look at the life of an NFL cheerleader, the darker side of what may seem like a glamorous lifestyle. Sending in the soldiers in the fight against the virus. The Pentagon set to deploy more than 1,000 troops to help get out the vaccine. Yankee Stadium opening as a mass vaccination site. And the concerns in Tampa Bay this weekend over the Super Bowl possibly becoming a super spreader. Millions in the middle. So many Americans out of work or underemployed. The latest economic numbers showing the need for Republicans and Democrats to get on the same page. How President Biden plans to move ahead without bipartisan support. New reporting on the Capitol riot investigation. What happened earlier that day as ABC News obtains new video showing Trump confidant Roger Stone flanked by members of a militia group the day of the deadly siege and what else we've learned about the hours before the attack. With a renewed focus on curbing harmful greenhouse gases, tonight Ginger Z and Gio Benitez take a closer look at emissions-free vehicles and show us why it's not too late to avoid driving ourselves to extinction. And it's the heartbeat of Washington, D.C., a unique style of funk that stood the test of time. That's why it's called go-go, because it just goes on and on and on. While some sounds have come and gone, this rhythm, unique to D.C.'s vibrant black community, remains. Tonight, why the go-go sound refuses to be silenced. I feel like busting loose. Good evening, I'm Janae Norman in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you so much for streaming with us. The Calvary is apparently coming, or in this case, the U.S. military, in the life or death fight against COVID, and it is not a moment too soon. A staggering 5,077 deaths were recorded yesterday. Think about that for a moment. Our lives were completely transformed when 2,977 people were killed during 9-11. Yet in this crisis, some still don't even want to wear masks. Today, iconic locations like Yankee Stadium here in New York began to ramp up as it turns into a vaccination center. The news of a third vaccine, a one-dose shot potentially entering the market soon, could be critical in slowing down the relentless heartache and suffering that's plaguing our nation. We have so much to get to tonight, and Whit Johnson leads us off with more on those Pentagon reinforcements. Tonight, the Pentagon deploying troops to the front lines of the pandemic. More than 1,100 active duty service members, mostly medical personnel, right, here's the Pope. to help at vaccination sites. And soon, another weapon in the fight. Johnson & Johnson moving closer to emergency use authorization. Its single-dose vaccine, 66% effective overall at preventing moderate illness, but much more powerful against severe disease, including that highly contagious South African variant. The good news is that when you looked across all of the countries, the protection against truly severe disease was well over 80 percent, in fact, about 88.8 percent. .8%. Also of interest is that in the South African study, as well as all of the others, there were essentially no hospitalizations or deaths. An FDA public hearing now set for February 26th. The first shots possibly going into arms as soon as March 1st. Johnson & Johnson promising 100 million doses by summer, but the White House today acknowledging supplies would be limited at first. We have not found um, that the level of manufacturing um, allows us to have as much vaccine as we think we need coming out of the gate. And tonight, growing concerns about Sunday's big game. Let's not have the Super Bowl become the next beginning of a huge surge here in California. Health officials urging Americans to avoid Super Bowl parties that could turn into super spreaders. In Los Angeles, restaurant screens will be turned off. Still, 22,000 fans will fill about a third of this stadium in Tampa where masks are mandatory. Face coverings are a requirement. Our Will Reeve is at one of Super Bowl week's main attractions. Here at the Super Bowl experience, signs like this are everywhere. Face coverings are required and social distancing is encouraged. But this weekend, from New Jersey to Kansas, officials are easing restrictions in restaurants and bars just in time for the game. I was a little surprised. Um, I thought maybe they might wait till after the Super Bowl, but I'm, I'm ecstatic. But in New York today, one iconic stadium with a new purpose in the race to vaccinate. 
It's opening day of a different kind here at Yankees Stadium. 15,000 appointments in the first week. People lining up down the block in the rain to get their shots. The way things are going, we needed it. What was the process like to get an appointment here? Uh, a disaster. Really? Uh, it took, my wife has been uh, on the computer for the past three weeks trying to get on. And Janae, we're learning more about that troop deployment. This will be one of the first big moves from the new Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin approving FEMA's request to help speed up vaccinations. This first wave of more than 200 service members will arrive in California in the next 10 days with more missions to come. Janae. Our thanks to Witt. And joining me now to discuss more on our nation's progress in the battle against COVID is former acting director for the CDC and former ABC News chief health and medical director, Dr. Richard Besser. Dr. Besser, thank you so much for joining us on this Friday. Let's start with vaccine shortages. They continue to be a big problem. Right now, only about 8% of the population is vaccinated. And as you know, that is a long shot from herd immunity. When can we expect this backlog to get sorted? And do you fear that making people wait longer will cause some to be completely dissuaded at the idea of getting vaccinated? You know, Janae, I, I think one of the big problems here was, was expectations. You know, I, I think the idea that there are tens of millions of people in America who've been vaccinated uh, for an infection that was absolutely unknown about 15 months, al uh, months ago is, is almost miraculous. Uh, and and the, the idea that there will be enough for this country by this summer is absolutely terrific. Until then, uh, we all need to wait our time, wait for our, wait for our groups to be called uh, so that we can ensure that those who are at the greatest risk, those who are uh, going out every day to, to get to work are getting vaccinated. That's critically important. Yes, it absolutely is. And so there is some positive news this week. COVID cases, deaths, and hospital admissions continue to decline nationally. Of course, that's after the surges that we saw following the holidays. Do you think that this finally means that we're turning a corner and on a bigger picture, getting a better handle on the pandemic overall? Well, you know, I, I'm always really careful to, to to not try and predict the future because we've been fooled by this virus many, many times. We could see a similar picture here to what was seen in the United Kingdom, where numbers went down and then jumped up as a new strain arrived. Uh, but the combination of doing the right thing and, and getting vaccines rolled out uh, gives me a lot of hope that we will turn the corner and we will see an end of this pandemic. And Dr. Besser, that's exactly what I want to ask you about next. These variants, we've heard you know, some experts worrying that the variants could cause a surge in the future, in the, the coming weeks. Dr. Fauci has said that we should double up with the masks and that overall it seems vaccines do a pretty good job against them. But talk to me more about your concerns with these variants. Do you think that we could be underestimating the threat? And what should we do more of to make sure that we aren't battling a new COVID crisis in just a few months? You know, what it, what it tells me is that we can't underestimate the, this virus. Uh, and it also tells me that the conversation about controlling COVID can't be limited to how do we protect people within our borders by vaccinating people here. We have to be part of the of, of the global the global movement to vaccinate the world. And I'm really thrilled to see that the U.S. has rejoined the World Health Organization. The U.S. has rejoined uh, the, the wealthier nations that are working to provide vaccines around the globe. And Dr. Besser, do you think that here in the U.S. we should be doing more testing to look for variants? And I mean, even exploring the idea of more variants within the U.S.? Definitely. You know, and this is something that the CDC is ramping up, you know, look at, looking at, at different parts of the country and, and selecting a proportion of, of all of those viral strains and looking at the genetics of those to see, is it the same strain that's been around or is it one of the new variants that's been seen elsewhere or is it a variant that's, that is emerging here in the United States? It's part of staying on top of this. And it's critically important we reach communities that are being affected the hardest, get it, uh, those communities where we're seeing the greatest toll in terms of hospitalization and death. And Dr. Besser, in so many communities around the country, the debate over schools reopening continues to be a very contentious one. So explain to us why a teacher who's not vaccinated should feel safe about returning to work if you think that they should. And what makes returning any safer now than returning back in the fall? 
Yeah. So, you know, last year when when the, when this virus first hit, the recommendations were that that schools should close. There was real concern that this virus would act like the flu virus, where children played a critically important role, big role in terms of amplifying spread in communities. What we've seen here, and there are a number of studies now that have looked at this both around the globe and in the United States, is that if you put in place the measures that have been shown to, to protect children, staff, and teachers, you can get children into school learning safely. It requires an investment. It means making sure that schools can hire staff to do screening and cleaning. It means making sure that you can decompress your classroom so there aren't as many children in each class, that you can look at your ventilation to make sure the airflow is good, and making sure that everyone is wearing masks. When you do that, in many communities, you find that the rate of infection in the school is much lower than it is in the community. So it's, in a sense, saying it's one of the safer places to be. Teachers should be in one of the primary groups that are being vaccinated. So after you do healthcare workers and people in long-term care facilities, the CDC recommends that, that people who are in essential jobs, so whether it's working in a supermarket or food production, being a first responder, or being a teacher, they should be in that next group. But what we're seeing is you don't have to wait for vaccination to get children back to school safely if you're investing in, in, in those protections in the school. And that's what a lot of parents like to hear right now, Dr. Besser. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure having you on. Thanks so much. Really nice talking with you. And now to the economic fallout from the pandemic and the battle over a new COVID relief package in the nation's capital. With millions of Americans struggling to get by, President Biden is not backing down from his effort to deliver those $1,400 checks. So where does the plan stand now? Here's ABC's Mary Bruce. With job growth sputtering and millions of Americans suffering, President Biden today calling for swift action on his COVID relief plan with or without Republicans. I'm going to act. And I'm going to act fast. I'd like to be uh, I'd like to be doing it with the support of Republicans, but they're just not willing to go as far as I think we have to go. The House today voting to advance Biden's blueprint after the Senate approved it overnight, with Vice President Harris casting her first tie-breaking vote. The Senate being equally divided, the Vice President votes in the affirmative. The nearly $2 trillion proposal includes $160 billion for vaccinations and testing, help for small businesses, and for most Americans, $1,400 direct payments. And on that, Biden today made clear he will not budge. I'm not cutting the size of the checks. They're going to be $1,400, period. He is willing to reduce the number of Americans who qualify for those checks, but Republicans are pushing back at the overall steep price tag, and they say the president isn't interested in real negotiations. It looks like you're pushing your agenda with the disguise of wanting to interact and then doing it 100% the direction you want to go. Nearly 18 million Americans are now claiming some form of unemployment, and more than 50 million people, including one in four children, are going hungry. What Republicans have proposed is either to do nothing or not enough. This approach will come with a cost. More pain for more people for longer than it has to be. And Mary joins us now. Mary, some tough words from the president there, but he has said he wants Republican support, but he is well willing to get his relief plan passed without it. What does the latest polling show about how that might go over with the American people? Well, the latest Quinnipiac polling shows that 68 percent of Americans support the president's plan, including 37 percent of Republicans. The White House is eager to cite these numbers. That's exactly what they pointed to today when I pressed them on why they're still optimistic that they may be able to get some Republican support here. But the reality is we are seeing no movement at all in these talks. The president is holding firm on his insistence that they do this large, nearly two trillion dollar bill. So right now, Janae, it certainly seems unlikely that Republicans are are going to come around. And at the same time, so many people still in need. Mary Bruce, thank you so much tonight. Thank you. And with the debate still raging over the next COVID relief package, we take a look at another group getting squeezed by this pandemic, America's small business landlords. ABC's Trevor Alt shows us how many are struggling to pay their own bills as rent payments dry up. The coronavirus pandemic has upended our lives in countless ways, but the first of the month still comes calling at the same time, and rent is still due. I'm behind on all of them, so I'm always robbing Peter to pay Paul and sold anything that I've had that's worth selling to try to make ends meet. 
For nearly a year now, pandemic shutdowns have led to unprecedented job losses. Now more than 10 million Americans are unemployed, something real estate investor Andrew Lacey empathizes with. If it comes between paying rent that they technically aren't forced to pay right now and feeding their children, I, I understand what they're going to pick. I can't be mad at that. In January, more than 10 million people were estimated to be behind on rent and utilities. And since the start of the pandemic, more than $57 billion of rent and expenses have gone unpaid. I can't do anything about it. $3,800 is a lot of money to me. I have to borrow money from people. The CDC has taken extreme steps to protect renters, extending its moratorium on evictions until at least March. But that means the burden of those missed payments is frequently falling to the property owners, many of them struggling themselves. You know, my husband also lost his job. So you, it used to be a supplement income to, to, to our family, but now it, it is the main source of income. Many believe that property owners are wealthy, and there are certainly a number of billion-dollar enterprises that could withstand stretches of missed payments. Mom-and-pop landlords manage more than 22 million properties in the U.S., and they're counting on the narrow margins they make from rent payments in order to get by. The mom-and-pop segment has been hit especially hard. Um, you know, this is a group of individuals who have decided to, instead of putting their money in 401ks, they put it in real estate. I can see people thinking of it as binary, whereas the, the property owner is the monopoly guy and the tenant is uh, the guy who shines your shoes. And when it's a lot more of a graded scale. Everybody talks about the institutional class. It's a very small percentage of the overall housing in this country. One of those mom and pop landlords is Tammy Mason. We have not received rent since March of 2020. While working a full time job and caring for her young son who's distance learning at home, she and her sister have been renting out the home they inherited from their father to support their 80 year old mother. In the past year, she says she's lost out on $25,000 in costs. The rent we received basically covered the day to day costs of owning a home, which is mortgage, utilities, insurance, property taxes, and any money left over was really to support and supplement my elderly mother's income. Right. So this wasn't some kind of cash cow operation for you guys where you were snatching up houses and renting them up. Yes, that is correct. There is a biased presumption that if you own a rental home, that you are by means considered wealthy. Rental housing groups say on average only 10% of rental income ends up in the pockets of landlords, with the first 90% going toward mortgages, taxes, and maintenance. If somebody misses that first month's rent, you're talking about, what, 8.3% of that profit going away. If they miss the second month, then you go into negative range. And small-time landlords are what the industry refers to as naturally occurring affordable housing. If they're unable to make their mortgage payments, then the bank could foreclose on their property. Unlike a big you know, commercial real estate company, I actually went to the bank and you know, got these mortgages in my personal name. The bank could foreclose on my properties, and then they could also go after my primary residence, all my life savings, the latest COVID relief bill passed in December has earmarked $25 billion in rental relief, mostly going to renters to help make their payments, though Tammy says she's not eligible for those funds. The only option that we were eligible to, to consider was the mortgage forbearance. And Tammy and many of the landlords we talked to told us they don't view tenants who can't pay their rent as the enemy. What the issue will be is that we're not able to sell the home with a potential fair offer if it is renter occupied. You can't afford to keep it because you have renters there who aren't paying rent, but you also can't sell it to somebody else as long as somebody is still renting there. That is correct. She has no interest in kicking out families during a pandemic. She just doesn't want to be left footing the entire bill without government help. The Biden administration is trying to pass an additional $30 billion in relief funds in their $1.9 trillion stimulus bill. But the longer they wait, the deeper the hole for Tammy and millions of others. And the longer this goes on, the meter is running. We're just going to see a bigger and bigger deficit occur. For ABC News Live, I'm Trevor Alt. 
Our thanks to Trevor for that very insightful report. Well, President Biden saying in an interview his predecessor should not receive intelligence briefings because of his, quote, erratic behavior. This is the investigation into the Capitol mob riot heats up with the impeachment trial of President, former President Trump just days away. ABC News has learned impeachment managers are looking into possible connections between some of Trump's former associates, including longtime advisor Roger Stone, who Trump has pardoned, and people later seen at the Capitol. Chief Washington correspondent Jonathan Carl has more. ABC News has learned that as House prosecutors prepare to make the case that Donald Trump is guilty of high crimes and misdemeanors, they are reviewing videos of Trump associates in the hours before the riot, including this video from that morning, first brought to light today by ABC News, that shows longtime Trump confidant Roger Stone, who was pardoned by Trump, flanked by members of a militia group. So hopefully we have this today, right? We shall see. We shall see. We don't know what the men were referring to, and Stone has maintained that he played no role whatsoever in the January 6th events and said, quote, I had no advanced knowledge of the riot at the Capitol. <laughs> These men near Stone are clearly wearing the insignia of the Oath Keepers, an extremist group known to have been involved in the Capitol siege. The same men are later seen in news photographs at the Capitol confronting Capitol police officers. The House prosecutors will attempt to convince senators that the president incited the riot with his words and actions. And if you don't fight like hell, you're not going to have a country anymore. In this video shot by New Yorker reporter Luke Mogelson, some of the rioters make it clear they believe they are carrying out the wishes of Donald Trump. Jacob Chansley, the Arizona man who wore face paint and horns and who allegedly left a note on the vice president's desk. It's only a matter of time. Justice is coming. Says that he was there because President Trump wanted him there. He walked down Constitution Avenue and entered the Capitol. He was there at the invitation of and request of our president. Of the 182 accused rioters facing federal charges for their involvement in the Capitol riot, ABC News has identified more than a dozen who have said they were just doing what President Trump wanted them to do. Like Jenna Ryan of Texas, who told station KTVT, I thought I was following my president. I thought I was following what we were called to do. Another alleged rioter, Garrett Miller, seen here on surveillance video inside the Capitol, said in a statement released by his lawyer, quote, I believe I was following the instructions of former President Trump. His attorney says Miller now regrets his actions on January 6th and that they were a misguided effort to show support for Trump. And John Carl joins us now. John, there is still so much we don't know about this impeachment trial, which is just days away. But what do we know about who may testify and how long this could last? Well, Janae, it's entirely unclear whether or not there actually will be witnesses. The House managers would certainly like to call some witnesses. They would like to call uh, people that were at the White House to testify about what Donald Trump was doing in the hours that his supporters were going through the Capitol, and he was saying nothing publicly. Uh, but the issue here is that if they call witnesses, you will likely also open the door to the defense calling witnesses. All that could potentially significantly delay the trial, and Senate Republicans Republicans don't want that to happen. Senate Democrats don't want that to happen. And perhaps most of all, uh, the Biden White House doesn't want to see a long trial because every day that the Senate is doing the trial, they are not working on the Biden agenda. Our thank you to you, John Carl, there in Washington at the end of another very busy week. Thank you, Janae. When we come back, the former officer charged with the death of an unarmed man enters his plea. And it's about to get very, very, very cold for millions. Plus, the new snow threat our weather team is tracking. But up next, they're ambassadors of the game. But a new documentary is revealing the darker side of life as an NFL cheerleader. We speak with the filmmaker coming up next. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. 
What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. Reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace us! Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Burning. Now. When it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. It is almost Super Bowl Sunday, and the Chiefs and Buccaneers are getting ready to take the field, but they aren't the only ones prepping for the big game. Of course, each team's cheerleaders will be there as well. And while cheerleading for a pro football team seems pretty glamorous, behind the scenes, it can be anything but. Cheerleaders have reported low wages, pay theft, and rampant abuse, among other charges, leading some of the women to sue the very teams they work for. A new documentary, A Woman's Work, explores the dark side of NFL cheerleading and the women who fought back. Take a look. Game day doesn't completely make up for the fact that we work for nine months straight with no paycheck. You want me to volunteer my time so you can make money? Why would a grown woman want to be a cheerleader anyway? Show off your body. We had to stand there and do jumping jacks. Sometimes there was just nothing you could do. You're not cheering this game. They don't treat football players this way. They don't even treat mascots this way. Joining me now is Lacey Thibodeau-Fields, who you just saw in that clip there. She's a former Oakland Raiders cheerleader who sued the team. And with her is the director of Women's Work, Wigu. Welcome to both of you. Thank you both so much for being here with us. Lacey, I want to start with you. What were the working conditions like for you as a pro football cheerleader that led you and eventually others to sue? Well, um... Being an NFL cheerleader was exhilarating. It was honestly some of the best memories that I, I can think of in my lifetime. Um, it quickly became very frustrating for me, though. I had just made the team, and very quickly I was spending lots of money. I had a young family at the time, and my part-time job that I had you know, just signed up for was quickly becoming a burden to me. Um, I was having tons of out-of-pocket expenses. It was time away from my family, which I was very happy to do and dedicate my talents to the team. Um, but, you know, they weren't going to pay us till the end of the season. And just things throughout the season kept popping up, and I thought, this isn't right, you know. Um, this can't be legal, and it surely wasn't legal in the state of California. Wow. And, and let's bring we in. We One problem that you highlight are the restrictive contracts that all cheerleaders must sign throughout the league. Tell me about those. 
Right. So for Lacey's contract, I mean, when her employment lawyers looked at it, they said that it was the most illegal contract they've ever seen in the 25 year experience of them being attorneys. So, you know, everything from being paid at the end of this nine month season um, to getting fined for minor infractions to adhering to extreme standards and rules um, as outlined by their handbooks. Um, that's something that, you know, when they're given this contract, they're not allowed, they don't have time to speak with an attorney or any agents or any other representatives, they're, they're basically forced to sign it on the spot. Wow. And, and for a lawyer to say it was one of the most illegal contracts that they've ever seen is really eye-opening. Lacey, you and 100 other women who joined your lawsuit settled with the Raiders for $1.25 million. The other terms are still confidential. What do you think is the impact of, of that, of the confidential terms of the, the settlement on women who are still cheering today? Well, I, I have heard some encouraging things from the women that are still cheering today that they have changed the contract since the lawsuit. They are being paid every two weeks. I know that they have a new director now from when I was there. And I've heard some really positive things from the Raiderettes that are you know, continuing on the team of the changes that have been made. I can't speak for the other teams, um, but I really hope that they you know took the lawsuit and really made the change they need to so that they can really appreciate the dancers that you know we gave all of our talent to them and all of our time and energy and it's about time that they show that they appreciate that and and pay us properly and we this project represents so much more than a fight for cheerleaders it's about a woman's value in the workplace and even today the pandemic has brought so many of these issues to the forefront so many women disproportionately impacted by this talk to me about the the overall issue here right um i think a woman's work, you know, as it's been labeled traditionally, has been devalued. It has been seen as something that is, you know, a derogatory term. Um, and especially, like you mentioned, now during the pandemic, when women are leaving the workforce in order to in order to care for family, to, for children, um, you see that work being unacknowledged and sort of, you know, devalued again. So I think it's it's part of a larger conversation on how we as a society treat this kind of labor and how we would want to value it and also, you know, value the women who are giving it all to both society and to their families. And Lacey, of course, so many people will be watching the Super Bowl this Sunday. They will see the amazing women along the sidelines. Tell me when when the game gets started, when when we see the ball kicked off for the beginning of the Super Bowl, what will you be thinking and what do you want the millions of viewers tuning in to know? Well, you know, in, in no way would I want to tarnish the glamorous image of an NFL cheerleader. I know by exposing the ugly truth of what was really going on, some people may have felt like, you know, ashamed of what I've done, um, that I've maybe tarnished the image, but I did not. I just shed a light on a, a real issue that NFL cheerleaders have to face. You know, the audition process is so strenuous. They want a girl that could speak eloquently, who's educated, who can kind of do it all, be out in the community, be a great dancer, have the perfect body. You know, they want the girl that can just, you know, represent them to the best of their abilities. And yet they want to, you know, tell us over and over again, well, you're just lucky to be here. You know, this is the chance of a lifetime. You just get to be on the field. You should be happy for that. And I've always felt, and I know that other children out there feel, you know what? We do give all that we have to you. I wish that you would really appreciate that and, and treat us like a true employee and, and pay us properly and make us feel part of the family. And we will learn so much about what it is like to be an NFL cheerleader through this film called A Woman's Work. Lacey and we thank you both so much for joining us tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And still ahead here on Prime, the disgraced fashion mogul accused of sex trafficking crimes that he denies, but now his son is speaking out against his father. The future is now. How attainable are electric cars? Ginger Z has this week's It's Not Too Late. And how is the global vaccination effort going? Today was a milestone day. We'll explain by the numbers. But first, our tweet of the day. So many paying tribute to legendary actor Christopher Plummer. Who could forget his role as captain? Captain Von Trapp. I know what happened and I'm not guilty.
why the fascination with criminal trials, and figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart that he did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you believe the reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. You will not replace Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Admit it, these days what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. Assault on the Capitol, the ABC News original, exclusively on Hulu, now streaming. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir. We have made it through another week together. America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. Robin Roberts, George Stephanopoulos, Michael Strahan. Wake up with America's number one most watched morning show, ABC's Good Morning America. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for overall excellence in television. ABC News, America's number one news source. And now to some hopeful COVID news as we head into the weekend. Globally, the number of vaccinations has now overtaken the number of reported infections worldwide. So we take a closer look by the numbers. 119 million vaccine doses have been administered around the world, which now exceeds the global COVID case count of 105 million. It's a remarkable achievement, but sadly, the global rollout has been highly inequitable. More than three quarters, 75% of all vaccinations have been in just 10 10 wealthy countries that together account for 60% of the world's GDP, according to the World Health Organization. Meanwhile, almost 130 countries with a combined 2.5 billion people have yet to administer a single dose of the vaccine. And here in the U.S., almost 29 million Americans, about 8% of the U.S. population, have gotten at least one vaccine dose, surpassing the nearly 27 million Americans who have contracted the virus since the pandemic began. And still ahead here on Prime, we're tracking another, yes, another major winter storm and a brutally cold Arctic air mass. Plus, what do you know about the legendary go-go music scene based in the D.C. area? How that music has helped shape our nation's capital. But first, a look at our top trending stories on abcnews.com. guide you through it all tonight. We have made it through another week together. Big hug, Richard. We tell all our patients how much they're loved to hold their hands. David, we're showing our love and support for all the ICU staff. They're the heroes in this. <laughs> When it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news.
The world may feel out of your control, but your happiness doesn't have to be. Learn the secrets to happiness. Listen to the 10% Happier podcast, free on Apple Podcasts. ABC News, honored. Winner for the second straight year with the Edward R. Murrow Award for Overall Excellence in Television. ABC News, America's number one news source. This is GMA3, what you need to know. GMA3. A third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon. It's all about you. Lunchtime on ABC. The reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Friday nights, 9, 8 central. True crime, cinematic, real-life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9, 8 central on ABC. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Tonight, the Pentagon deploying troops to the front lines of the pandemic. More than 1,100 active duty service members, mostly medical personnel, Hi, here's the Pope. to help at vaccination sites. Encouraging news too, Johnson & Johnson submitted its one-shot vaccine for emergency use authorization to the FDA. If authorized, that vaccine could be available as soon as March 1st. And tonight, growing concerns about Sunday's big game. Let's not have the Super Bowl become the next beginning of a huge surge here in California. In Ohio, former Columbus police officer Adam Coy was arraigned on charges, including murder, for the December fatal shooting of Andre Hill, an unarmed black man. Coy had entered a plea of not guilty. Hill's family attorney says body cam footage shows the officers on the scene did not try to provide aid to him after he was shot. Growing confidence now of another significant snowfall for the east. We've got winter storm watches that are posted from Georgia into New England. There you see the low. That piece of energy digs into the south. Day morning, D.C., Philly, Roanoke, Richmond. You might see more snow than you saw with the last one. This one doesn't linger. So because of that, it'll get out of here. Generally speaking, three to six inches of snow, but right along that I-95 corridor. And brutal cold coming into the Midwest. Look at these numbers. 37 below zero expected in Chicago for a wind chill. 40 below in Minneapolis. Some of that cold sneaks east. So what does fall here on Sunday will not melt. Canadian fashion designer Peter Nygaard will remain behind bars indefinitely as he faces a number of sex charges. A Manhattan judge has denied Nygaard's request for bail, citing concerns he might flee or tamper with evidence. The 79-year-old fashion mogul is accused of raping teenage girls after luring them with promises of modeling opportunities. He had been asking for home detention as he awaits trial. In the upcoming Discovery Plus documentary, Unseemly, one of Nygaard's sons, Kai Zinn Bickle, says he's been bringing evidence against his father to the authorities, hoping it will help keep him behind bars. He will say whatever he needs to say to whoever he needs to say it in order to get the result that he wants. Do not believe that he should be allowed out of the jail because he is so dangerous. Actor Christopher Plummer has died at the age of 91. Christopher Plummer did not love the role that made him an international movie star. Do you mean to tell me that my children have been roaming about Salzburg dressed up in nothing but some old drapes? Mm -hmm. He played the strict Baron von Trapp to Julie Andrews' Maria in the 1965 blockbuster The Sound of Music. The Sound of Mucus, Plummer is said to have called it, but he later warmed to the movie, as did his character to Andrews character Maria. Plummer had over 200 credits to his name. When he was nominated at the age of 88 for replacing Kevin Spacey in All the Money in the World, I do not have the money to spare. He became the oldest actor to get such a nod. He won two Tony Awards and was an accomplished Shakespearean actor. 
Asked once if he would ever retire from acting, he said retirement is death, and so he kept performing. Plummer's Sound of Music co-star, Julia Andrews, released a statement remembering the actor this afternoon, saying, quote, the world has lost a consummate actor today, and I have lost a cherished friend. I treasure the memories of our work together and all the humor and fun we shared through the years. This week, General Motors made the potentially game-changing announcement in the climate change fight. They want their cars and trucks to make zero emissions by 2035. That automaker is not alone, with many nations inching closer and closer to eventually mandating it in the future. Ginger Z has more on where the electric car technology stands. I'm Ginger Z, and it's not too late. I'm coming to you live tonight from my electric vehicle. Okay, I'm not live, but it is electric. No gas, no emissions, just plug in and go. I remember being back at the Chicago Auto Show in the mid-2000s, Chevy debuting the concept car, the Chevy Volt, and thinking, yeah, it's happening. Jetsons, here we come. It's just that the market hasn't quite moved at light speed like my imagination was. Only 2% of vehicles that are on the road right now are electric. But I do think that's about to change for real. One of President Biden's first big moves on climate action is to change the federal government's fleet of vehicles, all of them, like mail trucks too, gonna go electric. That's almost 650,000 vehicles that drive trillions of miles each year. But what about the rest of us? One of the big reasons that people have not gone electric is something called range anxiety. The range at a full charge is almost 400 miles. So my husband's been driving it for work and his commute, he's really only having to plug in twice a week. But what if you wanna take a trip? Well, if I tried to go home to Michigan, say, there are supercharging stations along the way. However, it's gonna take me an extra two and a half hours on what's already an 11 and a half hour trip because there just aren't enough supercharging stations along the way. But the Biden administration has a plan for that too. They are promising the installation of more than a half million charging stations all over the country. The president also would like to create one million jobs by shifting production of all these green cars right here to America. These aren't pie in the sky dreams. These are concrete, actionable solutions. Now it's no secret that our gas-powered cars are no friend to the environment. Transportation makes up more than a quarter of our total greenhouse gas emissions. That's huge. And it's more than the power grid, more than the smokestacks that you see polluting the sky. Transportation is our biggest source of global warming pollution. Burning gasoline in cars just pumps huge amounts of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. Actually. Five years ago, power plants were the biggest source, um, but we've actually been making progress in cleaning up the electricity system. Electric vehicles lead to significantly less emissions. Hybrids, of course, release less CO2 than the traditional gas-powered cars and trucks. And if we all switch to electric vehicles tomorrow, say, we could slash our emissions by two thirds. For the average car that's on the road today in the United States, it's better to drive even when charged 100% on coal than to drive on gasoline. But we're not 100% on coal anymore. We were 50% on coal in 2001, and now we're less than 25%. Samaris also says it's possible to eliminate 90% of carbon emissions by 2050, but to do that, we have to make big changes, and we have to make the changes now. We're gonna have to electrify 80 plus percent of the miles that people drive in order to get deep cuts in our carbon pollution in the transportation sector. All the onus isn't just on electric vehicles. Samara says that we also have to just have a cultural shift. We have to make it easier for everybody to drive less. We also have to make public transportation better. There are up to 10 new electric trucks and SUVs that are entering the market just this year. We're gonna be following all of them. To get the lowdown on all that, I talked to my buddy and transportation guru, Gio Benitez. There's been talk of hybrid and electric vehicles for decades. Why is it taking so long? 
You know, it's one of these things. I mean, even now, what is it, 2021 now, and now GM is saying 2035 is when they expect to uh, be able to stop selling gas and diesel cars. Right. Um, so it's it's still a ways away. We, we still got a ways to go. And other companies, they're trying to do this too. Uh, Ford, they came out with that Mustang Mach-E. I don't know if you've seen it. It is a beautiful car. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's going to be very attractive to people. It really comes down to when we are now driving a Tesla, people are just scared of new and different. And they have, what like some of the big myths, I've had people even say like, well, you really can't go that far. Yeah. And that's just not, not true anymore. It's not true, but I will say what is true is that you don't have, you know, right now you can get on the road in a regular car and you can find a gas station anywhere. Yeah. You can't find an electric charging station everywhere. And so I think because that infrastructure isn't there just yet, there is that fear. And, and some of it may be legitimate, some of it may not, uh, where people say, if I get on the road and I need to charge this car, where am I going to charge it? Am I going to be able to do the great American road trip and still find a place to charge the car? Uh, I will say, I think price is also a big problem, um, you know, because obviously EVs right now still a little more expensive than regular cars and you know so i think those are really practical things for a lot of people and and installing you know a, a charging station at home and i imagine when nissan and gm and gm especially because gm is that american made and the ford the f-150 is going to be huge 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 that's when i'll see michigan filling up my dad that's what he'll wait for yeah, and, and, and that speaks to, you know, this is a truck and SUV country. And I think once we start seeing that, I think people might say, huh, okay, this might be interesting. I think GM's move is gonna be really monumental when we're looking at other automakers. Yeah. Well, uh, coming up in this series, uh, I'm actually gonna drive the Mustang Mach-E for the first nice. time. Nice. My, my first electric vehicle, and that's gonna be for you, so. Wow, good. It's never too late, right? We're, we're, you know, every 10th of a degree matters that we can avoid carbon pollution and global warming. But the faster we act, the better our opportunities are in the future. And if we want to have a very close to zero transportation sector in terms of carbon pollution, the sooner we start phasing out those gasoline vehicles, the better. The sooner, the better. So we can ensure that it really isn't too late. And our big thanks to Ginger and Geo for that. Up next, the sound designed to keep you grooving. Stay with us. Now, when it matters most, the straightforward facts. ABC News is America's number one news. Number one in the morning. Number one in the evening. With America's most watched newscast. Number one in late night versus the competition. The number one news magazine on Friday nights. Number one in politics across this historic election versus the competition. The number one daytime talk show. And number one in streaming news. ABC News is America's number one news. The most powerful stories of our time, anytime. Nightline. Friday nights, 9 8 Central. True crime, cinematic, real life drama, stunning, the unthinkable. Follow the clues, the hunt, true crime. 2020, Friday nights, 9 8 Central on ABC. Admit it, these days, what you need to know seems to change just about every day. What is it that you really want to know, need to know? To help you not just get through your day, but to make the most of it. Feel smarter. Feel better. Feel happier. Well, how about a third hour of Good Morning America in the afternoon? GMA 3, what you need to know. Lunchtime at 1 Eastern, 12 Central and Pacific on ABC. It's all about you. I know what happened and I'm not guilty. Why the fascination with criminal trials? Figure out what's really out there. She revealed she had murdered his family. I know in my heart they did this. It's the time of suspicion. The ending's really tough. You don't know whether truth is going to be difficult to find unless you try to find it. Do you 
reality is our country can collapse from within. You see the white power movement on the march. Klansmen and neo-Nazis, skinheads, it's meant to incite war. From the KKK to Oklahoma City to Charlottesville, the new documentary event special. We just need to start talking about race. Homegrown hate, the war among us. This is a real wake-up call. Streaming now on ABC News Live. Finally, on this first Friday of Black History Month, the sound of the nation's capital, and no, not the usual Beltway blabbering. We're talking about the nonstop beat of go-go, a style of music that is uniquely DC. And although some may be trying to silence that sound, as our Faith of Bube reports, you can try to slow it down, but nobody can stop go-go. Washington, DC, the nation's capital, home to the White House. Congress, countless museums, and the National Mall. But there is a rich culture outside politics that's less talked about beyond the metro area. And you can't talk about DC without talking about GoGo. GoGo, a free flowing funk music genre, originated in DC in the early 1970s. For decades, GoGo has been DC's most influential homegrown cultural creation. It is all live instruments, drums, congos, timbales, guitars, keyboards, horns, and everything. But the key to it is it's, it's heavy on the percussion. It doesn't stop. Once the band starts, they don't stop until either the end of the show or until it's time to take a break and then come back for the next set. So that's why it's called Go-Go, because it just goes on and on and on. Andre Johnson, the guitarist for the legendary Gogo band Rare Essence. He remembers when the heavy drum bass funk sound made its mark in the district. When we started, uh, it wasn't called Gogo, -Go, and when we started, hip hop wasn't even known yet. We were just playing DC music at that point, copying Chuck Brown. One time for Chuck Brown, y'all. The late Chuck Brown, known as the mastermind behind Gogo -Go music, also credited as the founder of the genre. He was the one that came up with the concept of as soon as you finish the first song, you start right away with the next song. known for his legendary live shows, a man whose reputation thrived on getting people to the dance floor and keeping them there for hours. His legacy lives on through the younger generation who took the baton and kept the music going. Brown's past paving the future for people like DJ Malcolm Xavier. He grew up listening to the music and now spins go-go records on the radio turntables. It's the sound of the city, it's the sound of the DMV. You know, for us growing up here, it was not something that we could ever think that there was any other music other than go go growing up your first introduction to go go is typically through your parents or your your, your uncles big brothers big sisters your aunts the legendary backyard band one of dc's most recognized go go bands to date collaborating with some of the world's most famous artists the band is most known for adding go go flavor to the hottest songs on the billboard charts when the audience hears the go-go version of the song, that makes them like the song, the original song, even more. Because uh, the go-go bands have adapted to it, and they've made it, you know, a different song than what it is, but they still love it. But for years, Johnson felt the groovy sounds of go-go were being silenced in its own birthplace, due in part to gentrification. Where go, go music venues once stood, condos and retail stores now occupy those spaces. And then the city ordinance crackdowns. I want to say two years ago, there was a noise complaint filed for this uh, Metro PCS store on Florida Avenue. Anytime you've driven past that uh, store front, there's always go, go music playing. The noise complaints igniting a new movement to keep the music going. Don't Mute DC, a movement that tried to save the music and shed light on the impact of gentrification. They stopped us from playing, from all the clubs and the parks, everything. Once that movement started, which was reactionary to, you know, gentrification, all those other things, 
it really made it kind of like we need to make sure that people know that this is our sound and this is what our city uh, feels like and stands behind and it's part of our history and you can't really erase that. How have you guys evolved over the years to keep up with the time? A lot of the old players like really abandoned Go-Go. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They were gone, went overseas and things of that nature. And like the young one, we kept it going. It just kept going out the generation out the generation. And though the music is still evolving, native lovers of the funky beats that keep going and going are certain their love for Go-Go will forever remain unchanged. It means the world to me because this is all I've known. And I think there's gonna be a huge, huge, huge resurgence within the next five years. And just keep having to show our future kids and our city and the lawmakers to put platforms together and different pieces together for our music won't die. But I ain't gonna let it die anyway, no matter what. I go to the steps of Capitol Hill, baby. 20, 20, 20, 20, 20, 20. For ABC News Live, I'm Faith Abube in Washington. You can't stop the go-go, our thanks to Faith. And before we go-go tonight, our image of the day, take a look at this school custodian who, with no one watching, he throws up a trick shot, nothing but net. He gets his stuff and he moves right on. Thank goodness those security cameras were rolling to catch that. That's our show for this hour. Stay tuned to ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. I'm Janae Norman in for Lindsay Davis. Thank you for streaming with us. Have a great weekend.